Hi, and uh, welcome to this installment of Frank and Mary here in Southboro. Uh, if you haven't seen this show before, my name is Art Bergeron. I'm an elder law attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 70 of us, uh, biggest firm outside of Boston, and as a result, everybody gets to specialize in what they really like doing, and I like doing elder law, which is why I do presentations at the Senior Center and stuff. This show is not about law. This show is about my friends Frank and Mary. You've seen Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Their goal in life is to live in their house till they die and be buried in the backyard. And if they're in South Bro, that means here. They don't want to be buried in San Diego where their daughter moved. They don't want to be married. They don't even want to go to Marlboro. They want to stay in South Bro. So the question is, who are the people they need to know? What are the programs they need to know about if they want to stay right here? So to answer that, I needed a person who really knows a lot about South Bro, and I found Doug Peck, whom I had known for many years, and then eventually convinced him to be the co-host <laughs> on this show, because he keeps, because he's living in, been living in South Bro for a long time, grew up in faraway Ashland, you know, but nobody holds it against him, and, and he just finds these great people, and today you found another great person. I think I have. So who we got? Uh, we have Nicole McGurin from the Alzheimer's Association, and we're going to talk about uh, dementia and Alzheimer's and what the Alzheimer's Association does because we we all feel that it's a very important uh, topic for people to to know and understand and know where to get information and help should you need it. And we were talking a little bit beforehand and it turns out you've been at the Alzheimer's Association for like a long time? I have. I've been at the association for 13 years in September. Yeah. I'm currently the director of family services and I oversee our 24-7 helpline and care consultation services for families who are caregiving for someone living with Alzheimer's as well as people who have Alzheimer's. Yeah, and we, we want to talk about that, that, that helpline and, and, and you also said that in your early, earlier life there, you also dealt with the program dealing with folks who have some early stage issues. Yes, my first job at the association, um, and actually my volunteer position before I worked there was working with um, early stage support groups um, and families and people who were newly diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So that too is an interest. There's a whole bunch. It is. Right? There's just it a is. whole bunch. Yeah, it is. So was there something in particular that got you interested in the Alzheimer's Association? Um, well, I, I, my whole career has been in working with seniors and home care okay. and nursing home and assisted living <clears throat> settings. Mm -hmm. um, and in all of those jobs, I, I got to have the opportunity to do some volunteering with the association through doing support groups and being involved with the Walk to End Alzheimer's. Um, and when an opportunity came to work for a mission-driven organization like the Alzheimer's mm -hmm. Association, I, I jumped on it. Oh, good. So you've been doing it for a long, like since it's, it's really grown over that time then. That, that, the organization has really expanded over this last like 10 years. That's like a big, that's a big deal. But can, so can you just start off by talking about the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia, which of course always comes up and people always get them confused and just kind of talk about that a little bit. Sure, I would be happy to. That's probably the most common question uh, in my line of work oh, that I get. Oh, you've heard this before? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's start with dementia. So uh, dementia is, is basically a category of diseases um, that uh, affect someone's cognitive functioning, usually starting with their uh, short-term memory, but mm -hmm. also involving their complicated thinking, their ability to make decisions, their ability to communicate, and even their uh, mood and personality. Um, and diseases that are dementias, um, they all do progress over time. Uh, there can be a lot of different causes to dementia diseases. Um, some of them, fortunately, are reversible. Um, people can have those symptoms mm -hmm. because they have a problem with their thyroid mm -hmm. or they have a medication side effect. Um, but there are also a host of diseases that cause those dementia symptoms that are not reversible. Um, and Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of those dementias, particularly among people over the age of 60. Um, and it's caused by actual physiological changes to the brain um, that um, impact how the brain is able to function. So it's, just, so it's a long-term thing, or the, what is a long-term thing? It's caused by a whole different set of diseases. Yep. Alzheimer's, the biggest cause of that mm -hmm. cluster of, of <clears throat> symptoms like ca called dementia, right? Can you, can you just talk for, first a little bit about those short-term ones, though? Because I think so often, like for, so I do nothing but elder law, so I talk with a lot of old people, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Which I define myself as one. Mm -hmm. I'm turning 70 in, in January, so I almost couldn't remember when I was <laughs> um, So, you know, I'm very kind of familiar with, with the, the issues, and I hear those questions. And I see people that, like, went to the hospital, and they were like, okay, and then all of a sudden they're getting a dementia diagnosis, you know? 
And I talk to people, I say, well, you know, it might be the drugs, it might not be this, you know. So you just kind of talk about rever reversible Sure. So there Dem are dementia symptoms that are really reversible. Yeah. yeah. So there are a lot of different reasons that people can have dementia symptoms. I think among older people, commonly it's uh, medication side effects. It could be um, a thyroid disorder or a vitamin deficiency that can cause those symptoms that are irreversible. Um, and sometimes it can be caused, you know, by as you just mentioned, by a sudden change in someone's environment, like going to the hospital and and being sick in the hospital. That can cause those symptoms too. Uh, and the reason why it's written, and and the reason why it's really great to get it out there, and I'm glad you asked that question, is that um, when people have those kinds of symptoms, a lot of times people just make an assumption that they're having those symptoms because someone got older, or there's nothing that they mm -hmm. can do about those symptoms. So why, you know, why bring them up? Um, and it's really important if someone's experiencing those symptoms mm -hmm. themselves, or if a family member's noticing it, that they ask the doctor about it to try to get to the cause of that. Because sometimes in, you know, in doing that diagnosis, something that's actually treatable is uncovered. Mm -hmm. um, and even if what's uncovered is not treatable, like Alzheimer's disease, um, there are lifestyle changes that can improve someone's ability to cope with that disease. There are some medications that can help with the symptoms. Um, and without that proper diagnosis, um, people just don't have an opportunity to access those. So, it, so all, dementias are a disease, and they're ver uh, is what you're saying, and there are a number of different types of them. So I'm assuming that one of the reasons you're, you're encouraging people to is to go to a doctor or to talk about it with a doctor is to get an early diagnosis. Just like if you had uh, you know, a rash on your skin, you want to get a diagnosis of what it is so you know, is there medication for it? Can I, you know, when should I start using it, et cetera. So getting that kind of an early diagnosis can really help you in the, in the long term. Otherwise, like any disease, you wouldn't want to let cancer go without a diagnosis or any, any kind of serious disease. But it, they can be serious diseases. Absolutely. So, so why do people let it go? Why do people let it go? Um, well, I think that probably there's, you know, I think two common reasons, you, I think. Because you're seeing it all the time. Yeah, and I, and I, I'm asking you, but I'm also asking Doug, because mm -hmm. I know from your own work, you mm -hmm. know, when you're yeah. dealing with folks, sometimes this will come up. And, and you, you know, you've talked about sometimes the fact that it, pe people kind of don't want to know to mm -hmm. some extent. Yeah, I think that, you know, I think there are two common reasons. I think one is that a lot of people do assume that it's part of normal aging. Um, and yeah. for a lot of people, the onset of these symptoms is gradual. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if, they're, if you spend most of your time with a spouse, they might not notice it over time because it is so slow and mm -hmm. just assume it's a part of, of normal aging. Um, and I think the, the second reason that really contributes to people not seeking out a diagnosis is, is stigma about Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, people, uh, people know that if you have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, that you know, means certain changes might need to happen, that you might need help, that you might not be able to continue driving. There's all kinds of you oh. know, fears that are associated <clears throat> with that diagnosis, and right. that, that definitely causes people to kind of hide away from the symptoms, I think. Yeah, and when, as I think the hide away is a good you know, lead in as well, because people do, if you're, if you're, if you can't remember names, if you have a difficulty with some things, you're less likely to go out into the environments where you were socializing before and stay more at home, even if it is with a spouse, but the world starts to shrink a little bit. Absolutely. And I think that's, uh, Doug, one of the one of the big risks to not getting a diagnosis early is mm -hmm. that, you know, people do tend to hide away and, and isolate themselves because they're concerned about other people, you know, noticing the symptoms they have. Um, and, you know, with a diagnosis, you know, even though that can't be cured, you know, you mm -hmm. can learn coping mechanisms for those memory problems that people are having. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be open about the assistance that you need. And for most people, having a diagnosis and having other people know what's going on can actually help you to be less isolated and continue right. to get out there right because there's a lot you can do I mean I've seen people with diagnosis of dementia and I've seen them uh, four or five years later and they're still functioning at a fairly high level because it's that's the part of the disease though right it's the unpredictable nature mm -hmm. of it 
right? Yeah, and yeah. The, yeah, and I think that does scare people too, the un unpredictable nature of it. But I think you sharing some stories of people that you've met too, you know, highlights that, you know, one of the most important things I think people can do in the beginning stages of Alzheimer's to keep functioning as high as they can and to stay independent, mm -hmm. you know, is to continue to be active socially, um, mm -hmm. you know, to continue to exercise physically, to eat well, to take care of their other health conditions. All those things really um, can enable a lot of people to stay in the early stages of this disease for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So as, as, you, as you were saying, that the, the, the as you, actually as you both were saying, that the, that socialization piece is, staying social is really important, mm -hmm. but, but what is an interesting segue for the folks that have got the diagnosis too, is that you, you, you kind of want to be knowing people who are going through this. Right. Right? Be, and, and, and th but through that, you end up finding that a ton of people are going through this. Mm -hmm. Right? So many people c come in, I'll talk to folks, they really believe they're the only ones, you know? It's like, oh my God, how can this be happening to me? You know, because the immediate people that they're dealing with, no one, no one has, has the disease. Mm -hmm. But then you, you get them into one of your wonderful, the wonderful support groups for both the, the f folks who have got the, 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 uh, the symptoms and for their caregivers, and suddenly there's like another community. It's like right. a community that opens up. And that's what I was gonna ask you about. So what's a support group like? You know, I mean, you said you, you help run some support groups and you start them up. So when should people go, give us, can you give us a sense of what it's like when you, know, when you go to a support group? Sure. Um, so the Alzheimer's Association um, in Massachusetts and New Hampshire is able to provide um, almost 100 support groups across, wow. uh, across our state um, that are led by volunteers mm -hmm. that we train and screen mm -hmm. at the Alzheimer's <clears throat> Association. Uh, and these support groups are a wonderful resource for families and people living with Alzheimer's. Um, and I urge people to, to, to check them out. Mm -hmm. um, but most support groups are anywhere from you know, five to usually around 10 uh, caregivers mm -hmm. in, in a support group. Uh, and uh, they tend to um, focus on, on whatever problems the people in that group are experiencing that week. Um, and the idea for support groups really is to, um, to facilitate some conversation among caregivers to help mm -hmm. one another. Um, mm -hmm. Because this disease is, I think you said it, Doug, yeah. unpredictable. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also affect, it's, it affects each person uniquely. Um, and while it's great to talk to an expert and we urge people to mm -hmm. do that, you also can learn so much from other people who are in the same situation from mm -hmm. you. Um, and the purpose of the groups really is to enable caregivers to share those tips and strategies with each other um, and also to, um, to lend some support so people know they're not alone. Right, and, and unlike a lot of other diseases, the caregiver assumes a huge burden, right? I mean, particularly if the person's staying at home, which many want to do as long as possible. So they also get isolated. They, Absolutely. there's a lot that goes on there for the caregivers. So besides support groups, what other kinds of services does uh, the association offer for, for caregivers? So the, um the Alzheimer's Association off also offers a 24-7 helpline okay. um, where caregivers, people with Alzheimer's, and the general public can mm -hmm. call anytime, day or night, and speak to an expert about any question related to Alzheimer's disease, any problem that they're facing, mm -hmm. um, and even just if they want to share they've had a tough day and get some support okay. around some what's, support. Yeah. what's going on. Um, by, and, by the way, parenthetically, yep. and all of this is free, right? Abs yes. So people need to understand that you're not, you're not selling a service. I mean. You do a ton of work around fundraising. We can talk about that at the end because you're doing some important stuff. But as a result of that, what you're doing for these folks is free. Yes. Right. Um, so anything we talk about today that's for families yeah. and people living with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. is offered yeah. at no cost uh, to families. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, I, I really urge people to check out the helpline for that yeah. sort of help, um, as well as uh, in Massachusetts, you have the ability to schedule a, a consultation with one of our staff members at one of our offices, either in Worcester, Waltham, Rainham, or Springfield, Massachusetts, to you know talk to a, a social worker about what's going on with your individual situation and, and get a care plan to deal with um, your specific challenges. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you this yep. at the beginning. I'm mm -hmm. going to just step back a minute. But the Alzheimer's Association, there's a national association. And then we're, I think we're pretty fortunate in Massachusetts to have the, the Mass in New Hampshire one. Is it, I understood it to be one of the oldest and first 
of the associations, is that correct? That's correct, yes. The, we started out as the Massachusetts chapter, but okay. we, um, we, took, we, uh, we welcomed New Hampshire um, probably at least eight years ago now, but the Massachusetts mm -hmm. chapter is one of the founding chapters of the Alzheimer's Association. Um, and there's a whole network of chapters across the entire country. So any town or city that someone lives in um, has the services that we're talking about available um, to them. Okay, so if somebody that's living in Mass, for example, they might have parents in Iowa yep. or someplace that, that are dealing with it. They can call and get information or encourage their parents to call, but it doesn't make any difference. No, it doesn't matter where you live. Yep. Okay, well, that's good to know. Yeah, I was going to say, that's really, yeah, that's really exciting, and, and vice versa, because you get so many folks who grew up here and have moved away, mm -hmm. and then, you know, Thanksgiving comes, and there's that inevitable, oh, my God, mine's isn't quite the same, you know? What are, yeah. But they have no idea about how any of the programs here work. So you're really, you're the first, the first call. We are usually yeah. the yeah the twenty four seven helpline. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and, and by the way, can we? I bet that we can get that number on the yeah. as a, right. Yes. Yeah, we'll get that on the, right. at the end. And the uh, and the website because the website has a lot of good information, even some programs that are very, very simple in terms of sort of training programs for people to take a look at because it's really about you end up dealing with behaviors and the behaviors yeah. get very different from person to person and you need a little help to know. Should I argue with this person? Yeah. <laughs> Should I try to, what do, you, what yep. do I do when this comes about? I bet that's a majority of the calls you get at the helpline. Yes, I think that you know, the, the majority of calls we get at the helpline are, are around cha challenging behaviors and um, making decisions about what's safe for somebody, I think, are okay. our, our, our top reasons. Yeah. Um, but I also do, uh, Doug, I would urge people, and I know we're going to list this at the end, to check mm -hmm. out our website. Um, there's a lot yeah. of really great information on there. We, there see, are, we can actually run this as a banner throughout this yeah, show. There's, yeah. a, there's, an right. on, there's online education useful. programs, yeah. um, and for mm -hmm. those who are... Um, tech savvy, there's the ability throughout the website now for people to live chat and get answers to their <clears throat> questions that way if that's how they prefer to get their information. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a really great great source of information. Oh, good. So there's a chat version of the 24-hour the, the helpline? Yes, you can actually just that's like, new, yes. Yeah, I was yep. going to say, I haven't seen it before. <laughs> I haven't been on the website Hot for a while. Hot off the press. <laughs> I, gonna, I don't know if I could ever figure it out. Yeah, you <laughs> could. That stuff a little kinda, box comes out. It's very you, easy. You that stuff kind of happens. <laughs> So can, now, can you go back to one of the, the, the programs that you had said you were dealing with kind of early on in the Alzheimer's mm -hmm. Association for folks who are kind of just starting to experience some of this? Can you just kind of talk about what the, kind of the unique challenges of that and what, the, what, the, what programmatically people can be doing in order to try to deal with those kind of the early stages? Sure. So I think in the um, early stages of Alzheimer's disease, um, some of the biggest challenges for people living with Alzheimer's and their families are are that isolation. Mm -hmm. I think some challenges around around communication and kind of organizing organizing someone's day. Um, can be tough. Uh, and I think that we have a wonderful program called uh, Taking Action, which people can find out about um, from our 24-7 helpline, mm -hmm. which is a um, four-part education and support series that really um, is intended to educate people about what does this diagnosis mean, what's going on, um, so that people understand that the symptoms they're experiencing are not their fault um, and that there's a real you know, cause to them. Um, but then also learning about what are some coping strategies, strategies around those symptoms? What are some ways that you can um, you know, remember important appointments? What are some ways that you can stay active? Um, as well as learning about um, recommended diet changes, the importance of physical exercise, um, and also ways for uh, people to get involved with the cause. Okay. So it's a whole variety. So just for example, so could you give people an example of, you know, re regarding diet or regarding coping things, some of, the strat some of the things that come up in terms of strategies, things that you can do? Sure. Um, so some of them, I think, are as simple uh, are simple as um, reminding people to use a calendar. You know, mm -hmm. but in the case of someone who might have early Alzheimer's, to start using the calendar for for just about everything. For a lot. For a lot of things. For you might lot. put on your calendar mm -hmm. things like Tuesday is trash day. You know, things that you might have relied on your short-term memory to, mm -hmm. to remember. So um, I'm feeling like I already have kind of early, early. Because right? <laughs> don't you find yourself? You're not that early. No, but don't you? Oh, <laughs> no, you're killing me. Don't you, don't you find yourself, though, you're just in, you're increasingly you're taking notes, right? Because you're just saying to yourself, why do I have to waste memory space <laughs> trying to remember this thing, right? Well, it's a challenge. Yeah. 
It, yeah. is, it is a challenge. But that is one other thing we urge people mm -hmm. to do is to yeah. start getting in the habit of, of taking notes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, you know, the more people in the beginning stages can have a routine around, um, around their daily activities, the longer mm -hmm. they're able to do that. So I think lots of the strategies are really around, you know, how can we form habits mm -hmm. um, and make, make tasks that we want to continue to be able to do part of our long-term memory that's a lot stronger um, than your recent recall. So, mm -hmm. you know, giving people strategies around that. So that's and what really, I found going, really to the, going to the website, although I haven't yeah. been for a little while, is that although this is a very complicated disease, and dementia in general can be very complicated, the website is super friendly. It's really in language that anybody can understand, and it's really about practical things that people that are dealing with the disease can use. You know, I know you folks do a lot of research mm -hmm. uh, and fund for a lot of research. You can talk a little bit about that. But the website's not like that. It's not a technical, scientific website. It's really something practical that people can get a lot of answers to. Yeah, and I think that, you know, with a disease like Alzheimer's disease where there, there's not a pill that cures this disease or magically makes symptoms mm -hmm. disappear or slows it down, unfortunately, and not yet, not you know, yet. we're working on that. Mm -hmm. um, but there are so many practical strategies that caregivers and people with Alzheimer's have learned uh, throughout <clears> the years <throat> that really make a big difference in somebody's day to day. Um, and that's really the purpose of the website. It's the purpose of the 24 seven helpline, our support groups, our education programs, are all around sharing that really important information with people um, to make their lives easier. So is part of that also like a referral service? Because I know a lot of uh, primary care physicians are hesitant to diagnose dementia because it can be, can be difficult. And again, no one wants to give that kind of bad news to somebody that they've known for 10 or 15 or 20 years. Right. But they may call concern that they're seeing this. Yeah. So can you refer them to a neurologist or other folks? There's a lot of memory care yeah. units in the, in the area. So people can call our 24-7 helpline or visit the, or visit our website, okay. whichever way they prefer, to get referrals from anywhere to memory diagnostic clinics, to elder law attorneys, to home care providers, to day programs, okay. support groups, a whole all range of programs and services that can help people from anywhere, starting with the diagnosis, like you mentioned, but mm -hmm. also to you know finding long-term care Find and long everything and everything in between. Everything in between. Because yes. I, I know one of the issues, even with primary care physicians is that a lot of these folks, I, I agree, they're kind of afraid to make the diagnosis and I, and I know that a lot of these folks are, are being trained more. More than, now, yes. But they also, once they make the diagnosis, the question is then what? Because right. it isn't like so many of the other diseases, here are the pills, we'll see in six months. It's this whole set of adaptation programs and all of these other pieces of which many of these doctors aren't necessarily aware because it isn't kind of medical model treatment mm -hmm. you know right. it's a real challenge it is yeah. but again i think we're fortunate to live in massachusetts first of all we have a governor and a, and a legislature that are really strongly strong proponents of, of making people aware of it mm -hmm. and really enacting legislation such as uh, legislation to that all doctors need to be informed about dementia and about alzheimer's disease but a lot of that really has been driven by the advocacy of you guys. It has I been. I think the Alzheimer's Association, I remember talking to there was a wonderful guy named John Polanowitz, who had been, I would met him because he had been the CEO of our hospital mm -hmm. um, before he left to work for, for um, the, somebody, or for Stewart, before mm -hmm. he ended up being Secretary of, of Health and Human Services here. And I remember talking to him on an, an unrelated issue r regarding a, a, a particular problem, and he said, you know what you really need to do this? He said, you really need the backing of the Alzheimer's Association. He said, the Alzheimer's Association has such credibility here, right, in the legislature and in the governor's office, if they want it, it can really have, has a chance of getting done. It's a very, it's a very I mean, it's a real testament mm -hmm. to what the Alzheimer's Association, I don't know about other states, but what they've done here mm -hmm. in terms of your credibility. It's really something. Really yeah, we've something. been very fortunate in, in Massachusetts to have that support mm -hmm. um, and have the leadership of our chapter as well as the, you know, hundreds and hundreds of volunteers that do work with us on advocacy um, because we can provide the structure and the training and arrange meetings around these issues, mm -hmm. but what really gets mm -hmm. the attention of the governor and of the legislature is hearing from families and their constituents that this is a disease that's important to them, that's mm -hmm. impacted them. And in this state, we've had a lot of really brave families, you know, step forward 
forward and, mm -hmm. and use their voice. And, and I think that's made a, made a real difference. Now, I know when, it, when we were talking before the show, we talked a little bit about this evolution of this so-called dementia-friendly communities movement here. And I know Alzheimer's Association has been kind of cutting edge in terms of supporting some of those programs too. Can you just talk about that a few minutes for a few minutes? But what kind of what, what or how you imagine what is a dementia friendly community? Oh. <laughs> well, uh, everybody has a different. There isn't an official definition. Right. But what, what to you? What is it as a person who's seeing this stuff all the time? Yeah. Well, I think a dementia-friendly community is somewhere where um, someone who has the disease of Alzheimer's, you know, disease, um, feels welcome and is able to, you know, do the simple day-to-day -day things that we take for granted um, without a lot of trouble. You know, go, being knowing that they can go to a bank and mm -hmm. that if they're gonna if they're gonna have trouble finding their bank card, it's okay to ask somebody, "Is this the right one?" and mm -hmm. not feel embarrassed about that. Um, you know, I think a dementia-friendly community is somewhere where a caregiver um, is not concerned that if they go with their loved one to the library and need to go in, in with them to the bathroom, that there's a place for them to do that in a dignified manner. Yeah, dignified. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, it, it's, it's living somewhere where I think not just people with, with dementia, but with people with all different kinds of mm -hmm. um, diagnoses that require some support and assistance, um, you know, get that acceptance mm -hmm. um, and are able to again, move freely in their community and then and hopefully stay in this community as their disease progresses. Yeah, and then again, that's the why I wanted to have somebody here to talk about that because again, it's all about trying to stay in the community, but the community's got to be a welcoming community to that and understand what's going on. Understand that, that, be, that there's going to be some different behavior and we can make accommodations for it. Everybody's a little bit different. And I know we, we are again, very fortunate in this area. We have, I've lost track of how many memory cafes we have. Mm -hmm. The almost, I, I think there's probably four or five a week. A memory cafe right is, over. again, somewhere where you go for free. Uh, it's usually around lunchtime and you may get something to eat. They provide entertainment there and it's for the caregiver and uh, the, the uh, person to go and enjoy themselves for an hour or so, in a, again, with like people. And then we have Care, caregiver and, care, and, the, and the person, and who, the has person who has dementia together, right. And then we have a daybreak program in three towns now, and not soon to be a fourth town. I was just going to say. Marlboro, to Hudson, Northboro, and soon to be Sudbury, right. where it's a three-hour program where the caregiver can drop the person with dementia off. There's activities. There's lunch. Uh, and again, they're with people that are, have similar uh, issues. And, and the caregiver gets a tremendous break. And again, Just that's free and provided by various funding uh, resources around. So we're in a we're in a good place. That didn't have that. What those things did not exist, even just two or three years ago. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's been really encouraging in, in Massachusetts to see and um, the, the groundswell of support from a lot of communities. And that is so important because, you know, every community is a little bit different. And I think at the heart of so many people's wishes is to be able to remain in that community yeah. and, to, to, and to see programs emerge from where they're living makes such a, a big difference. And, and it's really important that we're seeing this now because as much mm -hmm. as Alzheimer's disease is a huge public health crisis now, with over 130,000. Wait, wait till we get old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with over 130,000 people in Massachusetts who have yeah. Alzheimer's or another dementia, you know, those numbers, you know, in the next, uh, you know, 20, 25 yeah. years are expected to double, maybe even triple. Right. So, you know, starting to put some of these structures in place and make them kind of a part of mm -hmm. our everyday life, mm -hmm. you know, is, is important to do now and it's going to serve us well in the future, too. And, yeah. and as, you, as you would kind of, when you were going through that kind of list of people who constitute a dementia friendly community, that notion of connecting all of those people so that the person in the library knows, mm -hmm. the person in town hall knows, the person in the bank, so that... that it, and even it, fire and police departments are and police all well-trained now again. Yeah. So when they yeah. go into a house, they understand that the behavior that the person is exhibiting, and so you, they're not as afraid to make that call, that mm -hmm. 911 call if it's necessary. And I know that a lot of that training is done by them. They are. The That's another process. point. You do a ton of training, don't you, for this? We do, yes. We do a lot of training around um, first responders. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also involved in training um, medical professionals, um, including doctors, nurses, and social workers, um, as well as providing training for kind of the front line of care for people with Alzheimer's and, and home health aides mm -hmm. and nursing assistants in nursing homes as well. Oh, good. 
So this was a great idea to have her come. This is terrific. This is just terrific. She also knows it really well from all different aspects. Yeah, well, yeah, but that's because she's we've been doing it for a long time, you know, because because it it is a it's like a collection of a whole bunch of different little pieces that put together add up to really allowing a lot of people who used to really feel they just had to hide in their house to be right. able to live in their li- right. to live their lives. So it's a huge impact. It's huge. Everybody. So yeah. thank you so much. We'll yeah. make sure that you, you know, we'll check with the folks here at the cable station. Make sure that the banner is up, your yeah. phone number is up, the 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 you know the helpline, all of that jazz. Yeah. Thanks a yep. million. Thank you. Really appreciate thank it. You so thank you so much for having for me. Thank, thank you, Doug. <laughs> yep. Yet another great guest. Thanks. We'll look forward to seeing you <laughs> on the uh, next installment of Frank and Mary here in Southboro. Thank you very great. much. Thanks.